Right, so good afternoon to all our Bloodlines followers and supporters around the world. And of course, uh, a very special good morning to Lord Ashcroft. Um, I really would like to thank you very much, Lord Ashcroft, for, for agreeing to join us here on this live stream. Um, we owe you a huge congratulations on the work that you've done, um, the exposés, and of course, this incredibly well-researched book that you've just launched in South Africa today. I know it was what, two and a half, three weeks back in the UK. Um, and what's interesting is we, we're having this discussion at a, at a time or in a place here in South Africa where awareness is starting to really pick up now because that video clip, that short film that you made, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it has been seen over 330 times, 30,000 times. Uh, since we put it up on our Facebook page. By far and away, the highest hit rate of any um, clip or, or news item on uh, these horrific industries. So many congratulations on the work that you've done and uh, great to be speaking to you. So I'm going to start. The book was launched, what, three, three weeks ago in the UK. What sort of uh, feedback and response have you had? Well, we've had, uh, we've had a very good response. And we've even had uh, members of our parliament uh, wanting to form a small committee to ask questions in the uh, House of Commons um, and uh, cross party, uh, which is very good, the Conservative Party and the uh, Labour Party. Uh, the Mail on Sunday, one of uh, our biggest uh, selling Sunday newspapers, uh, ran extracts from the book over many pages having actually covered it um, last year in 11 pages as a preliminary when we started the investigation. And the amount of support that is coming in has been uh, quite extraordinary. It's a matter of converting uh, that support into action. And so the support is often the easiest part of a campaign. It's where you go from there uh, that is uh, invariably a little bit more difficult when there are vested interests in what you're trying uh, to promote or attack. Absolutely. I mean, we found that uh, all the way through with the bloodline process um, and my work prior to that as well, which I guess is uh, very apt then that the book has been launched in South Africa today. Um, and uh, I'm sure it's going to sell very well here as well. Um, if I could just ask, what are your expectations of the, the launch here in South Africa? Well, a, n a number. Of, I'm hoping that more South Africans will understand what is happening uh, in South Africa and, and to come to a view as to whether uh, this small section of wildlife uh, harms brand South Africa. Uh, you know, we could, you know as well as I do, having done work yourself, the whole area of the of cub petting that cubs pull from their mothers uh, within a few days, walking with lions, uh, the slaughterhouses, the bones that have no medicinal purposes but yet uh, uh, could have health uh, impact. Going to the uh, uh, the Far East, gullible students coming down. Uh, believing that uh, they're helping abandoned lion cubs uh, when they don't see back of house, slaughterhouse, and the stripping of the bones. And I would suggest that uh, I'm trying to direct as many people as possible to the website lordashcroftwildlife.com, where, where there is dramatic and upsetting footage of what goes on, together with uh, photographs of the slaughterhouses and the, and the lions in the process are being skinned for their bones. And I'm hoping that an abhorrence uh, will build. And not only is the book being launched in South Africa today, uh, but in the next couple of weeks or so, we're launching it in the United States. Uh, we hope to uh, launch it in Canada. Uh, we're trying to, uh, to get many, many more people and politicians, not just in South Africa and the UK, but in other countries to start to focus on this captive bred lion industry, this brutal trade. Yeah, I mean, uh, Lord Yashkov, you speak, you speak very clearly there about the brutality of these industries. And uh, it's, you know, for someone who's been involved since, what, the 1990s, 
it's it's the one factor that has been striking to me as well all the way through. Um, but you know, you, you've you've discovered this brutality after having gone onto these properties and 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 cut the film. I mean, what was it in the first place that that got you to do this comprehensive project, which included Operation Simba and Operation Chastise? I mean, what struck you initially? Well, for, for, first of all, my love of South Africa that goes back many years. I first set foot in South Africa as a kid in 1948 and have been a regular visitor uh, to South Africa over the years. And I was in South Africa with six ex-military men uh, who were suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. And I'd organized for them to go to a, a rhino orphanage sanctuary and pair them up with a baby rhino who had lost its mother to uh, one of the poachers uh, so that they could equate with the stress that the baby rhino was going through and also brought down uh, as the psychiatrist that was dealing uh, with these six ex-military men. And when I was uh, in South Africa on that particular project, I heard about the captive bread lion industry and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And the first uh, operation uh, was to get a group of special forces to go to the Northwest province and fly drones over the farms and film uh, what could be seen as the, uh, the lions um, in their cages, uh, the slaughterhouse, uh, so on and so forth. And in fact, um, on one occasion, one of the drones malfunctioned and came down in one of the lion pens. And one mm -hmm. of the special forces guys, without hesitation, climbed over the fence into the pen to recover the drone uh, so that the farmer there wouldn't see that there had been intrusion. But all these places, these farms, well protected, out of the way, well mm. patrolled, um, divided between front of house and back of house, many of them. On the front mm. of house, on the tourist side, uh, where unwitting people come to, uh, to pet. And the back of house, where on two days we established 54 lions have been slaughtered. And we also bought a lion off the internet and a special forces uh, uh, operative went through the whole process of buying the lion, coming to South Africa, to the farm. Uh, whilst he was there, of course, he made it his business to poke around and take some extra photographs and then to go on the hunt. And then at the last minute to make an excuse not to kill the lion. But having purchased the lion, uh, we then made arrangements to save it and uh, taken it to a uh, sanctuary uh, elsewhere in South Africa. So technically, I own one lion uh, that is there. But there are 12,000 approximately uh, in these conditions. And one is only one. Is only one. Mm. Uh, but... Uh, but we mustn't under, underestimate that this is a small group of people in a cash-based business, highly corrupt to the highest levels in South Africa, uh, that perpetuate uh, this abhorrent industry. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in the fact that you were actually able to uh, take your lion off the property when we bloodlines that a similar sting we try to do the same and we found out in the small print that in fact we had only paid for the skin and the head and that we had to pay a whole lot more because the the, the operator actually said no no the bones belong to him and those were going to be shipped i mean that's how callous and brutal and just horrific the whole industry is um Lord Ashcroft, one very interesting element of the book and the whole uh, sequence of events was this, um, uh, so, uh, the, you know, the submission of evidence against the breeders and hunters that you collected and then submitted to the South African police services. Um, and they not only rejected the evidence, but uh, threatened to arrest your team. And, and we're interested in, in whether you're intending to take any further steps following um, the rejection of this evidence. Has there been any, any follow-on to that? 
Well, as, uh, we have made sure that this new committee, this high-level committee that is reviewing uh, wildlife generally under the, your Minister of Environment, uh, Barbara Cressy, we have made sure that every one of them does have the book um, and also uh, where they can find the video uh, footage. Uh, my concern on the committee is that there is quite some discussion as to whether this is really an independent committee uh, because of some of the members have interests uh, in the trade itself. And there's also a doubt as to whether this committee, when it uh, does report at the end of this year, whether that report is public. And so there is a concern and I hope it's unfounded that th this is more of a stitch up uh, than a genuine attempt uh, to establish exactly what goes on uh, in the captive lion bread industry. I, I, at, the I mean, same t at the same time, of course, I'm expecting the Conservative Party in its manifesto has said that it will ban the import of uh, body parts and that will be a start. Uh, I hope uh, that there'll be in some international pressure uh, on the export of bones from South Africa on medical grounds. We've seen that uh, the wet markets in China over the start of COVID-19 have been the start of other viruses. And I think that as there is no medicinal purpose to the bones, uh, to try to put some international pressure on that aspect as well, and certainly for those uh, tourist companies in the UK and others uh, that sell uh, lion uh, petting and walking with lions as part of the uh, tourist attraction are fully aware uh, that uh, this is only uh, the tip of the iceberg in terms of what goes on uh, behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, so on that high level panel, I'm sure you're aware that uh, a number of members have resigned and there are also a number of uh, people who were asked to be on the panel to replace the resignations and, and they turned down those appointments for, for the exact reasons that, um, that you've just raised. So yeah, a lot of um, issues around the impartiality of that high level panel. Just to come back to the, to the, to the South African Wildlife Crime Unit that rejected all your evidence, so nothing further has happened there. You haven't had an opportunity, for example, to resubmit that dossier or that document. Um, they haven't um, called on you to, to resubmit. No, we've, we felt at the end of the exercise uh, that we should give a dossier of information to the authorities. And uh, the team leader went to see a, uh, a senior official. We have named him in the book, by the way. Yes. Uh, to uh, present uh, the evidence and they were greeted with hostility, told to get out, uh, told that they were lucky they weren't being put in orange uh, overalls um, and marched out and the dossier handed back. Uh, that, uh, that was just part of what the team had found generally in its uh, year or so in South Africa. Mm. Uh, that there was a combination of blind eyes and uh, I'm not suggesting in this case uh, straight corruption uh, but certainly a, a lot of payments being made to ensure that uh, these farms have a quiet life. Okay so, so I know also that the Minister has issued a statement that um, she and her panel and her ministry have noted the context of the book and your allegations so have they, for example, has the minister called for that dossier? Have they called for that evidence to be presented to her high-level panel? Not, uh, not as yet. Uh, and I would, I would hope that the book itself uh, contains sufficient in there and that, that my website shows sufficient films that if they have a, a detailed interest to go further, uh, they have the ability to do so. But at the same time, uh, not uh, to remember, the, the NSPCA have started on the back of the book and the information, and we have given them more video footage 
uh, for them and they have started a criminal investigation. Uh, their concern is the resources that they have and the ability um, to go very further. So there's a, a resource issue for the NSPCA. Um, and my team are having a look at whether that there is something that we can do uh, on the financial side uh, if they believe that it's a resource issue, uh, that we can either raise some funds or do something to ensure that whatever investigation uh, goes on into the farms that we have identified uh, don't get stalled uh, uh, before they can get to a conclusion. Yeah, so, so really, I mean, you're experiencing pretty much what we experienced in bloodlines and what, you know, others, including myself, prior to the bloodlines have experienced, and that is this constant uh, blocking, stonewalling um, with regards to presenting of evidence and, and reporting of incidents. Um, I mean, on that then, just in a general sense, I mean, do you have any expectation of the South African government dealing with this issue? Um, do you have any sense that they are going to try at least be impartial and take some action? Or do you think it's just going to be whitewashed again? Well, it, if I went through life as a, as a pessimist, we, we wouldn't do anything uh, mm. at all. Uh, but certainly right now, with all the other issues that South Africa is facing with COVID, uh, many issues are not being pursued or handled uh, as they should be. And uh, I would suspect at the moment that uh, the high-level panel is, uh, uh, is trotting along. Uh, I don't think the government is doing anything more than this high-level panel. It's a bit like kicking it into the long grass, you know, buying a bit of time. Um, and... Um, so I'm not optimistic that in the short term, but it is such a brutal trade that, that it is not to be given up on. It's not to say, ah, shrug of shoulders. Uh, many, many um, campaigns in life have, have had a slow start, uh, but persistence eventually. And I think uh, international pressure uh, on South Africa, that this blot uh, on uh, South African tourism, uh, it, momentum will grow. We don't know how as yet, but it has all the ingredients. You've only got to show people some of these clippings. And, th and these clippings are just fortunate that, uh, that we've managed to surface them. Uh, I mean, what goes on unrecorded is truly awful, as you well know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, um, you know, another way of putting this is that we're just tipping, I mean, they're scratching the, the tip of the iceberg here. Um, you know, we're getting a snapshot in time, but can you imagine the sort of collection of br brutal events and, and killings and the way it's all been done over a whole year? I mean, it's just too awful to think about. Um, the other thing that we were, I, I was particularly interested in, and, and, and the Bloodlines team is, is that your, the work you were doing in Botswana um, and you know, unearthing the links between the capture of lions in their protected areas and then trafficking into South Africa. You know, a few of us have been aware of that. I mean, can you shed any more light on this? And did you present that evidence to the Botswana government? No, we haven't, we haven't, as, we haven't as yet. Um, that's not to say that we won't, uh, but, um, but in July of 2019, we did obtain uh, solid proof of wild lime bones being smuggled from Botswana into South Africa. And these bones came from poached lions. They were hidden inside the spare tire of a four by four driven by two white uh, middle-aged men who offered this illegal cash uh, in a back street in Christiana, an agricultural town in Northwest Province. And the scene, frankly, was as squalid as a drug deal. And the, these men appeared to have had no difficulty getting the contraband into South Africa, and they were well organized. And they had weighing scales and showed their wares uh, from a secure fenced uh, area. 
So it was fairly easy to confirm the flow of endangered wildlife products into uh, South Africa. Uh, but we, we pressed on knowing the importance of being able to establish uh, that uh, live animals could be obtained as well. And in Botswana, as you know, uh, wild lions are considered a pest by farmers due uh, to their habit of uh, hunting capital and livestock. And as a result, it's not unusual for them to be fed meat uh, containing toxin and then shot as they lie uh, dying. And their bones are sold into the trade into South Africa and their cubs, and this is the important bit as well, introduced into South Africa's tourist market until they're mature enough to mate. And it was made clear that wild cubs could be obtained uh, in this way. And this was to increase the gene pool of the captive breds um, uh, lions. And one of my undercover operatives went on a poaching trip in Botswana with two men who were serious criminal operators who hunt lions to order for a South African dealer. And yes, they were about to target a pride. And at that point, uh, my operative left because he obviously wanted no part in this. Uh, but he confirmed that poachers were prepared uh, to commit wildlife crime uh, to obtain uh, bones and cubs. And if we were able to establish this, uh, we thought it wouldn't be hard for South African police to do the same thing. So we know there is that cross-border uh, traffic uh, where wild lions, and so people talk about conservation. Well, what is conservation about shooting wild lions uh, to bring their bones and body parts and cubs back into South Africa for breeding and then ultimate slaughtering anyway? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's just awful. Um, so you, you've mentioned a few times now that the tourism sector and, and here, you know, the, the, the cubs coming across from Botswana and going into these facilities. You know, I've always felt that um, this is one of the more insidious uh, parts of this whole industry because um, a lot of these places, they claim to be against can hunting and they, and they tell how well they look after their lions. But in fact, they're all part of the same brutal chain. And... I was just wondering whether you know there, there, there's any thoughts or whether you, you, what you think the worth is of starting a campaign in the UK targeting all the travel sectors, so the volunteer agencies, the um, you know the, the responsible tourism sector, uh, and and uh, to, to you know to stop the visiting, to stop the walking, to stop the cub petting, and and um, whether you think that could be effective. I, I think all the areas, I mean, once the, uh, the dust settles a little bit on the book in UK, South Africa, the USA, is to see how much support that there is. I mean, the one thing that I wouldn't want to do is to start any campaign to stop tourists generally coming to South Africa because of one aspect uh, um, of it, I think. Uh, so I, 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 I wouldn't want to go that far. But I do think uh, that uh, the tourists to South Africa need to know that, of course, you can understand the allure for parents and their kids. Let's go and take you to go and pet uh, these cute lion uh, cubs. It, it's, it's a magnet. It's a tourist magnet. But, mm. but somehow, uh, the, there must be many people. These tourists stay in hotels. These hotels who have organized these trips must know the brutality that is going on, yet will turn a blind eye to be able to sell a tour into one of the farms. So it's not just inter international. Uh, I think there's some work within South Africa, within the tourist sector, uh, that, um, that can somehow uh, be able to point out to parents and others uh, that they are, in fact, financing this brutal trade. Mm. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that Bloodlines, uh, but, but many others as well have, we've done quite a lot of um, work on that front. We, we you know, we, we run that uh, Born to Live Wild campaign, and I think we've got close to 200 signatories, but those are all the sort of the responsible ethical tourism operators. Um, it is a big battle because 
there's this constant counter narrative you see from the, the breeders and the pseudo sanctuaries and they talk about their conservation credentials and they talk about the educational benefits. So you have this constant counter narrative um, that comes out. Um, Lord Ashcroft, just uh, in terms of the tourism sector and others, I mean, for example, do you think it's worth, under the banner of unfair game and this whole new global awareness that you've um, started creating, to go for some sort of a broad coalition involving tourism, the conservation agencies, and I don't know of a single conservation agency anywhere in the world that supports this, the scientific community, I don't know of a single uh, lion scientist or researcher that supports these industries, even the, the ethical hunting organizations, and of course, you know, the, the number of governments. I mean, do you think there's any merit in getting some sort of global campaign or coalition together to present to our government? Well, I, I would certainly be more than happy to participate in something. I'd be happy to, uh, to help finance something uh, that brought a lot of people together. Uh, I, so for me, it's an open, an open door as to uh, be able to assist uh, as, best I, as best I can. Um, I, I'm not a South African. I'd like to see more South Africans start to raise the tempo as well. You, you've done as much, to, you've done an enormous amount your, yourself. Um, but the point I made at, 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 at the start, or maybe just before we came live, is how surprised I have been of the number of South Africans who don't really know what goes on behind these fences and the cruelty and the barbarity and the conditions um, that these 12,000 lions have to live, born to die. Mm -hmm. um, so public awareness, I don't know whether uh, we can do some, uh, some media blitzing, run some TV ads. Many years ago, uh, when I was trying to get uh, a few Caribbean countries to change their vote at CITES uh, to vote against Japan hunting whales in the Southern Seas, I got nowhere with the politicians. And so I decided that I'd run television adverts in their countries over the politicians' heads, showing gruesome footage of whales being hauled out of the water, blood streaming everywhere, and asking the population, why are you allowing your government to support Japan in this brutal trade? And uh, it did have an effect, and some of the countries changed their, uh, their votes eventually. So sometimes you, you have to go even above the heads of the politicians. And I don't understand uh, the dynamics of South Africa as to how that could be, but I would certainly be happy to work with anyone that put pressure mm -hmm. on this, uh, this blight. Well, that's, that's good news. Um, yeah, I, I think you know, we, one of, the, one of the, the issues that we really do suffer from here is we suffer from a government who, as, as, as you now are finding out, but, but bloodlines and, and others that have been on these issues have, have known, it, you know, is a government who, who is, seems to be completely unwilling to do anything constructive about it, despite the global opposition from the scientific community, the conservation community, the tourism community. You know, it's not, it's not as if those communities are split. Um, even, the, even the ethical hunting community. So, Okay, well, maybe that's something we should explore down the line. Um, I'm also interested in, as we come to the end of this discussion, um, in the uh, fact that um, I believe that uh, some people have suggested that the way you collected information uh, for the book and for your dossier has made it impossible for this information to be used in court. I mean, what do you say to that? Well, we, we would use the public interest that, 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 uh, that what we did was in the public interest. And clearly it's up to lawyers and others uh, to decide uh, whether anything is, uh, you can actually use within a court of law. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not stopping 
on uh, lordashcroftwildlife.com for all this evidence to, to be there. So there's a dual purpose. Uh, there may be some difficulty in prosecution. They, uh, uh, all the farmers will have their own defense. Uh, they certainly, as we have found, they're not reluctant to lie uh, so, uh, or, or to paint a different picture as to the reality. And clearly, if they're quite happy to slaughter lions, then telling a few porkies cause them uh, any problems um, at all. But, but, um, but the most important thing is to ban the trade. Uh, if it means it's difficulty, difficult prosecuting uh, one or two farms, uh, that may be a price to pay. But it's the banning that we're going for, not just a, a prosecution of half a dozen farmers that we happen to expose. And uh, so, Lord Ashcroft, as we end this interview, um, on a more personal note, I, what is it that you, th I mean, there, there are two threads here. There, there's those that provide these animals, so those that breed them and, and provide them for cuddling and for hunting. Personally, what is it that you think motivates people that it's still okay to do that? And then on the other side, the second thread is, what is it that you think uh, motivates people to come and kill these animals, um, uh, you know, or to, to cuddle them, uh, knowing sometimes what they're doing. I mean, it's, how, how do you describe those type of personalities? What is it that well, I've drives been, the, I, 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 I've gone on record on the hunters, or so-called hunters, that are prepared to buy a lion uh, off the internet so they know what they're going to kill, are prepared to, uh, to go to this large fenced off area where a lion that has invariably been, been drugged on its journey uh, to this large fenced off area that they're going to shoot, who's been accustomed to human beings, where often the lion doesn't run away because it doesn't have the fear, and mm -hmm. sitting there with a high powered rifle just to kill the lion and then with a smile on their face to go for the kill shot behind the animal with their gun in one hand and a big smile on their face in order to take the body part back often to where they live to put on a wall. Uh, so my view of that person is it takes a despicable person to pay money to have fun in killing a majestic animal. And as far as the first part is concerned, is because it is cash lucrative, there are always people that will do anything mm -hmm. to make money out of what we regard as unacceptable. Yeah, I mean, it's just brutal and cowardly. Well, Lord Ashcroft, thank you so much for, for your time. Um, thank you so much for your work, your incredible contribution to what has been what 25 30 years building up um you know, bloodlines was able to bring a lot of work together over the previous 20 years but the film was launched what 2015 so it's fantastic that we have new a new initiative new blood new um awareness being created so we really are appreciative of the work you've done and your contributions. And um, I hope we can do this maybe in another two to three weeks time, once there's been some further or further response and reaction to, to your book. Always, always happy to do so. And I, I would ask whoever is listening to buy a copy of uh, Unfair Game. All the royalties go to South African wildlife. Well done. All, chat, all, all the royalties go to South African charity, wildlife charities and do also go on my website, lordashcroftwildlife.com and see these horrific videos for yourself. So to all our supporters and followers, uh, here is the, the copy of the book. This is what the cover looks like. And it went on sale across South Africa today. So do go out and uh, read it. Uh, it's brutal. Uh, there's a lot of horror in it, but if we're going to tackle these issues with commitment, then we need to know exactly what we're dealing with, and it's all in here. So, Lord Ashcroft, thank you very, very much indeed, and we look forward to chatting again in, in a short while. 
Thanks, thanks a lot indeed. Thanks for inviting me on. And good Excellent. luck in all the work that you do too. Great. Take care. Thank you. And thank you to all Bloodline supporters and followers out there. Bye.